<laughs> okay, we are recording with Cam McCarroll and James Maggs. And I want to ask you guys how you guys know each other, because you guys are both interesting characters. I'm not sure what exactly we're going to all cover here today. But James, you were saying something about real estate. Yeah. I should give everyone a quick intro. You guys have been in real estate a long time. You know a lot of stuff about real estate. Okay, enough with the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, what were you saying about investing and uh, you know how you learned from, I think you were saying Don. For sure. Yeah, so f- for me, one of the things that have always, that's always stuck with me about real estate where you know everyone gets, seems to get distracted by the next new shiny object. And for me, it was like, he said, if you want excitement, jump out of a plane. Don Campbell, if you want, for your real estate, real estate should be boring. And a lot of people have kind of done done flips and done that. And maybe some people were successful and a lot of people weren't. But I see a lot of investors. Flips that are not boring. Flips yeah. are fly by the seat problem, of your pants. Problem, pray, problem. pray to the Lord above that you're going to survive the experience. Yeah. But the long-term buy and hold investors that have just kind of forgotten about it and gone about their day-to-day business have been the ones that have yeah. seemed to have generated a lot of the most wealth. Mm-hmm. It's like the hardest thing when something is like a winner, like you were saying, just to sit on it, hold yeah. it. Right? Kim, what were you going to say? No, I was just like... You know, when you look back at the, what people have done, you know, in terms of real estate and how we've gotten into real estate, it's like, you know, your, your model here at Rockstar is, you know, single family homes and it's student rentals and, and then people move. By the way, I don't know if it's our model. It's, it's more just, what you're known it for. is like, I guess what we're known for, but it's like, not, we didn't invent the model. Of course. You know, it was more just like, I don't know. These things seem to like, let's just look at some numbers. This is these great. Seem- like, we're going to get through some stuff today that some pre- preconceived notions and <laughs> assumptions that we have about each other. Yeah, and well, and like, let's just no, it was more alive. just, it was honestly uh, th- where that comes from for us is our family almost lost everything in the nineties. Our dad was flipping properties, did a high end flip that almost wiped out our family because mm-hmm. it collapsed from $750,000 in value to we think about 450. That was enough to almost ruin us. And it was that moment that I think Nick and I real well, first we had to survive it. I was 17, Nick was younger. But then when we reflected back on that around the year 2000, I'm like, hey, what did we learn as a family? It was, oh my gosh, starter homes. They seem to be the most liquid, the most bank options, the most financing options, the easiest to refinance and get credit lines on. If we need to sell them, they're still a mar- even in a down market. Why don't we focus on starter homes for our own portfolios? So people started there, I think, as in- investors, right? Like you know, going through Don Campbell stuff, rain days. You know, it would be the you know the authentic Canadian real estate. Well, yeah, acre it was duplexes all, were not, not even oh, that's part of that right. it was just, right? but, it was all single family yeah. homes. But, no, so, no need for anything. Yeah, else. so by it was about geography, right? Like, like that's right. The top ten um, top cities ten, to invest the in gold in mine scorecard. 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 Right, so I forget that. You would do an analysis yeah. on a on oh a yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You would yeah. Drive by, figure out what are the economic fundamentals for that neighborhood. Yeah, and like you would score the house based on these this checklist. Right to see if it met all that criteria, wow. and that was your way of going from I think it was like the hundred ten five, like you look at a hundred properties, but mm-hmm. remotely, and then once you've scaled that down to your your ten, then you can go see those and then put offers on on five and get one. Or yeah, two. holy shit! And it, yeah. it was all about geography, right? Yeah. It was all about finding the right area and like the transportation changes and the city immigration that's coming into that area and like the neighborhood scorecard and all that kind of stuff. Like that's where we all and, and it's like over the la- over COVID. Like all of those metrics seem to just go out the window completely. <laughs> like it doesn't matter just, where you buy what. Like and it, it's gone. Like just all of, rip it all up and throw it. Yeah. But I, yeah. think, I think we like. I think as investors, you know, the simple and boring approach kind of it, it, it's it's like our human condition to like find a shiny object and go find something that is more interesting than what we've been doing because we get bored with it. Right? It's so like, true. It's also the story of that one person that made an extra hundred thousand dollars on a 30 day flip or something like that, that gets publicity. I should be doing better. That's yeah. They media. figured it out. Yeah. I better do what they're doing. Right. But all yeah. the guys that are sitting in the background making millions in, the, in a decade, that doesn't get talked about. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it, and I wonder if it's a second order effect of just that's gotten worse because of the monetary system. So people have been forced into real estate almost unconsciously because they are like, oh, my gosh, I'm not getting ahead with my income. Mm-hmm. My traditional investments don't seem to be uh, don't seem to be getting me ahead financially. I better dive into real estate. So maybe we just have more people who aren't doing as much research like with you guys into rain were you a rain member as well then cam so with you guys into rain like you're committed to going to different meetings you're educating you're reading books you're evaluating on a scorecard so you're doing things very diligently you're doing analysis whereas i feel like to your point cam like around the pandemic 
it just kind of went on steroids a little bit but also maybe there was just this second wave of people who were like holy shit real estate's the way to go i better get in um there's a lot more pre-construction condo activity so all of it together just creates this kind of fe- frenzy mm-hmm. but uh but yeah the winners do seem to be the ones who can just pick something and hold it for long periods of time right, right. Yeah, the the level of diligence and education from a lot of investors, I wouldn't even call them investors. They were really speculators because they saw what their neighbor was doing, bought a property, made money so I can do it too without understanding landlord tenant board. The questions that we I see on a daily basis on different, you know, Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups on how to deal with tenants where that's some of the basic knowledge that you should have had before you bought a property, not after you're dealing with a tenant one, two, three, five years into the process. So you're so thorough in the way you analyze real estate for yourself and I'm sure for your clients. Everybody says that about you, James, mm-hmm. the way you break things down. Not that Cam and I don't, but, you know, we just, you know, <laughs> we definitely hear that. About, you're famous for it. Yeah, you're, you're known in the community <laughs> as a very, very thorough <laughs> Um, um, how did you, like, how did you get into real estate? Like, I don't know if I know your entry point into real estate. It was, and it's, it's a very common story for, it was a pain point. So for me, I was, I'd been with Bell Canada as a senior project manager for, I'd been there for 15 years. So right out of school, my, my biology degree, put that to good use, went to Bell. <laughs> so went to Bell. Um, they both started with B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, I was, I kind of had the, we talked about the golden handcuffs. So I had a good job, good income. I was working from home remotely way before the COVID day. So I was actually a a teleworker on paper. I'd signed a contract so I could work from uh, anywhere. And so originally I was in Toronto and then because I was a teleworker, moved out to Hamilton and then I got a promotion. Part of that promotion was I had to come into Toronto on a daily basis. Um, They added probably 20 hours of work to my week without any real increase in pay. And now I'm also commuting into the office three times a week with, at that time I had a a newborn at home and I was like, I can't do this. I'm like, I I was, I think I did the same thing. I I thought about you when you talk about your forecast is, am I going to be here in the next 10, 15, 20 years? I'm like, I can't make it. There's no way that I'm going to make it to the retirement age to where I'm going to get my pension. And so at that point I'm like, I made a decision to like, okay, look into what options are there out there. I can start a new business. I can look at something else and uh, started reading books. And it was rich dad, poor dad. That was the one that I had talked to a couple of friends and then somebody had recommended that book, read it, learned about real estate. And I'm like, okay, this is it. And that's kind of led me down that path. And then I found Don Campbell's book and there's another guy's book was like in real estate investing in Canada, Douglas Gray, I think. I vaguely remember this book. And it was just basic concepts. It was like, this is appreciation. This is what mortgage pay down is. This is all. That was blowing you away. All this stuff. And I'm like, and I remember running my first uh, analysis on a spreadsheet and I saw the return on investment and I was like 47%. And I took it to my dad and I'm like, dad, does this make sense? And I was probably 30 at the time. And I'm like, people are getting 8% in the stock market. Why aren't they getting buying real estate if they can get 46%? And, he's, and we did the math together. And he's like, yeah, because of the leverage. And we've been talking about that a lot recently. And I'm like, that was that light bulb moment. I'm like, okay, so that's the kind of, and then I did all the research, found a, found a property manager, and I found out uh, who I thought was a good real estate agent at the time, who they weren't. I figured that out after. Um, and that kind of just led me down the path. And then what was your first pro- What was your first purchase? My first purchase was a legal triplex because uh, I was looking at what can I make? What can I buy? That's a thousand dollars cash flow a month. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was my goal. Yeah, yeah. And it was about, you know, it wasn't about it wasn't in the exact it was in the right city. It was in Hamilton, but it wasn't in the right neighborhood. So I still own that to this day. And this was from 2009. Um, but I, if I go back, would I buy that property again? Probably not. Yeah. We've so, all done that. Yeah. But thousand dollars. I remember you just gave me a flashback to one of our first in rentals was $1,800 a month cash flow. Yeah. $1,800 a month. That one was at York, which I don't own anymore. That's a different story. But it, it, there's, um, something you said that's really interesting to me is that in the analysis you did of your own life, you extrapolated yourself forward 10 years. Mm-hmm. That seems to be a common trait for people who make a big change in their lives. They have the ability to look forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it seems that not everyone does that. Like I just assumed Hmm. most people do, but it doesn't seem like everybody thinks about their own life 10, 20 and 30 years from today. And to, yeah. does that seem weird? It seems super but weird that people don't do that to me. That's because that's a, I, I think I always live. I probably in the reverse. Like I've lived in the future way too much. Mm-hmm. That's why I talk about Bitcoin all the time. I'm like, oh my God, do you see what's coming? <laughs> we got to act now. But um, yeah. as far as that for you, you did that. 
And then what was it in that analysis that made you, because you made a big change. You had a great job providing for your family there. Um, so you looked forward and then what? You just didn't like what you saw. You didn't like exactly. the way you felt. Was it a feeling you didn't like? Something specific you saw? It was a day-to-day -day struggle for me because I was dealing with the, you know, just the, the corporate environment and the hierarchy, right? So as, a, as an integrator, I was working with all these people and I'm like, we should make this decision. But the decision from up above was one that didn't make sense. And that was what was implemented. Mm -hmm. And it was a case, like, for me, it was like, okay, I need five people to do this job. And they're like, okay, I'll give you two. And so then it was, you know, I had to pick up the slack and it wasn't until the, something broke that they would fix it. And so we couldn't, we couldn't proactively get anything done. And so I was like, I can't live this life because it was it just didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to find a, a solution and a way out. Real estate was the initial point for me is like, I needed to buy real estate as a, a hedge to kind of figure that out. And then I kind of fell into being a realtor that kind of, kind of came down the road. Out, How many out. years later? Um, so 2009 is when I started looking to real estate. First property closed in January 2010. Got my real estate license in 2014. So it was about a four year kind of. And then when you got your real estate license, did you quit your job around 2014? It did, yeah. Immediately. So I, I, I got pretty lucky. So I had a really good director at Bell and I said, listen, I, I, want, I need a leave of absence. And the first leave of absence was 60 days. And that was to kind of figure my, my crap out and, you know, do the research into what does it look like getting a real, a real estate license? What do the exams look like? All that stuff. And then I was like, okay. So then I think about six months later, I said, okay, now I need a six month leave of absence. And then during that, I did all my exams, got my license within that period. And then, um, it, this was over the Christmas holidays and he called me and he said, are you coming back? And I'm like, oh, he knew. And I was like, uh, you know, uh, maybe. And he's like, are you coming back? And I'm like, probably not. And he's like, okay, we're going to lay you off. And so the, they were doing a restructuring huh. based on downsizing. And so I got laid off even though I wasn't going to come back. And so I ended up getting a severance package. Hmm. So that I was going to leave anyway. Twenty yeah. hours extra a week commuting to Toronto. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That looks looks sounds great. <laughs> yeah, work for myself. Like, so fifteen years uh, service ended up getting me. Uh, I think it was ten months of paid paid leave. So that first year, that's as, a nice as little a, cushion. First year as an agent, mm -hmm. I did have that kind of backstop, which helped me. Wow. Okay, I want to ask you more then about your journey. But then, Cam, what's your story? I don't know sure. much about your kind of backstory here. Yeah. How are you sitting here? How are you, how did you get to this seat here? <laughs> how did I get to the seat here? Yeah, no, it's, it's an honor to be here. Actually. It's a, I'm super grateful to be here. I'm, oh dude, you're too kind. It's awesome. I mean, like, you know, watch how many times have I listened to you interview people and to be sitting in this chair is a trip and it's, it's really cool. Oh, I love it. Shit. Um, you know, my backstory is, uh, I, I come from a music background. So I was a, a jazz guitarist for many, many years and professional in Toronto. And I was a professor of music, literally my title, professor of jazz guitar. Come on. At a, at a, a cool college, at Mohawk College, where I actually had a really good jazz program, a performance program there. Um, that Shit, you have actual talent in something. <laughs> the rest of us are just around here scraping together name. some spreadsheets and stuff, man. <laughs> You're an actual artist. You yeah. actually have some talent. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's debatable uh, um, <laughs> to this day. But uh, yeah, you know, it was that was my career. Uh, my wife's a musician as well. Uh, we met on a cruise ship. We were playing. I was in a jazz trio. She no way. What classical. cruise? What uh, cruise it line? Was Carnival, the fun ship. No way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, was, I lived on a boat for two years, literally. Uh, Shit. How small are those cabins that you were sleeping in? Really small. Like, yeah, small out of the size of this room. Like bunk beds you're sharing with yep. other people. Yeah. Oh. We had a pretty good gig when my wife was on board. She wasn't my wife at the time. but we, So you met on board? We met on board. And what a wild ride. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's a violinist. Um, so anyway, so yeah, we decided to settle down in Canada. She's from Poland, my wife. Uh, I spent some time in Poland. We actually considered living there at one point. Uh, decided the music uh, industry was going to be a little better in Toronto. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we, we moved to Toronto and, uh, you know, lived there for a while. My daughter was born in 2008. You know, we got married in 2004, had a, you know, our daughter in 2008. And um, I remember pushing my daughter around. I got the, I got the wind about real estate, right? Like, you know, I, I, I always had this thing about like time spent teaching, hour made, dollar made. And like, mm. I can't get there's like a ceiling, right? So that, that concept always just drove me nuts. Like I'm stuck. Like it's my it sucks, time. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, so real estate came as it does, you know, to, pe- to my, to my. Work. And then you stumbled into rain as well. I did. It was actually that, that was my introduction to real estate investing was through going to these rain meetings. And I had a friend who was going to them and owned real estate. And I was just enamored with the idea of like, you can buy one property and then, you know, perhaps leverage that property or how did that kind of blows your mind at first yeah yeah. i can take out equity from Mm -hmm. the property Mm -hmm. the bank will allow that yeah yeah i didn't understand it at all but um it did i knew there was something there so you know went to these rain meetings and i I didn't have any money i was like going to these real estate sure yeah like all of us i'm like how am i gonna do this i'm a real estate investor i have a business card you know (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's what Don's thing was, right? Be proud yeah. right? to be a real estate investor. What? Cool. Right? Which is interesting in itself, yeah. right? You know, the idea of being proud to be a real estate investor is certainly not popular these days. Um, no. I mean, it requires a certain <laughs> frame of mind that, like. Oh my gosh, I think we started telling people, get ready. In 2017, I feel like we had this meeting where we started telling everyone, get ready to be vilified. It's coming. 2019. Uh, I think 17, maybe mm-hmm. nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was before 19. We we're like, get ready. Yeah. You can see where this path is headed. Yeah. Be ready, it's get true. a thick skin, yep. investors are going to be vilified. And yep. all you're doing is trying to provide for your family. Yes. You're being forced into an asset yep. that you don't even really maybe want to get into, but yep. it's one of the only ways to get ahead because of the leverage. Forced in the ready. sense of like, what are your options? Yeah. For? That, and that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Whereas yeah, so. what else are you going to do? And I think it's just going to get worse over the next 10 years. Agreed. But, um, but keep yeah. going. So no, you no, went cool. into these meetings, yep. you, you checked it out yep. and realized I didn't, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, and then learned for six months, spent time just learning about real estate investing, listening to the CDs, pushing my daughter in the snow with the, mm-hmm. the, the, the listening to the CDs. Yeah. Right? We all had those CDs. Yeah. 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 So many. Yeah. And, uh, and just decided, uh, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch my dad. My dad's a retired school teacher. He's passed away now, but, um, oh wow. And uh, I said to him, Dad, like, you know, here's here's my model. Here's what I think I want to do. And would you be interested in partnering with me on it? And of course, you know, like a great dad. He, oh, cool, he man. Said, yeah, I'll do that with you for sure. And so we bought, we went and financed four properties back then. And four months we bought. What four. city? Also Hamilton? All Hamilton. Uh, actually, we got one in Barrie as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that was the start of it. And then similar to James, just, you know, we, we ended up moving to Hamilton um, where I was teaching and uh, just, got a license to support realize there's no cat i can't make a living off this like what no, there's not enough money right, yeah <laughs> sorry where were you living when you I bought was in the properties in hamilton we were in toronto oh, cool. at that time yeah but i do mean it's a shame i you know like when i was in europe a few years ago there were still like professional waiters hmm. like they made a full-time living to support a family yeah off being a waiter interesting they didn't even accept tips Wow. Like they were a waiter, that was a profession, and they could support a family. Now, over the last, I would say, five to, uh, I guess, 10 years, that's all changed. Right. But that existed. Like you yeah. could be a waiter as a profession. Like you would go to hospitality school very proudly, wow. become a waiter, and support a family. Yeah, it's like there's a bit of an erosion of... Of, of everything? Of everything. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, like the quality of everything's getting worse, and... Uh, in terms of material items, you know, the, and that's just a product of the fiat world. Yeah. We live in and I wonder if we see that reflected in music. You would see it more than me. Music's pretty hard to, I mean, in the industry, no doubt. Um, music's one of those things you can't, and that's what I love about it. It's like, you can't corrupt it. It, mm. it, you, it is what it is. You can hear it immediately, right? When something's been... F- Fiatized. Mm-hmm. No, or, mm-hmm. in that argument, I think as a musician you hear it, but I don't think the general person does. Because I mean, mm. Keith did a good presentation on AI generating musical content, mm-hmm. and it actually, if, I mean, if you just listen to it at face value, it actually sounded pretty good. Yeah. Um, but a musician might be able to see it, but it has the same like. The, the breakdown, the same system mm-hmm. that a, a normal pop song would have. Now, could they create jazz? Maybe that's a different. Yeah, there's no but, depth to it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're creating sound and space, right? Mm. And, and an environment and a feeling. And, you know, that's that's hard if you know what it, that's hard to fake. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. the beautiful thing about music. I, but I think it's there. I mean, people can't make a living. The music industry is really, really hard. Like the, the gigs we were making, $120, $150 for a, for a night of three mm. hours. And that's still the rate, like 20 years later. Oh, right? is it? Like, I mean, exhausting. You got to get all your equipment set up, tear yeah. down. You're tired the next day. It's tough if you have a, a family. Yeah, it's really hard. A lot of my friends are that were in the music business, It's uh, they, they have to find, you have to find something else, obviously. Mm-hmm. And that's the case with many gigs, right? I mean, uh, and you're going to lose your purchasing power and you have to find some way to 
to keep ahead or to stay on top or just to stay in the game. Right. And you know, real estate is a, is a pathway for a lot of people. It, people. Then did that lead to you getting your real estate license? Yeah. Because it was like, I wasn't making enough money with the property. Like we had, mm-hmm. we had cash flow coming in. We all seem to go down that path. Yeah. Oh shit. Okay. Wait what else can I do here? Yeah, What's yeah. this real estate license thing about? <laughs> yeah. And it, it became servicing investors only. I don't know if you were with Rockstar at that time, James, when you got started or if you guys were. Yeah. No, I started there. with Rockstar. Well, yeah. I, cause I, cause I started as a member. Yeah. Right? So I joined again for more education and then I think that was okay. most most rock star agents started as members, at least back yeah. then. It's yeah. it shifted in the last little while, but previously, I think you grew, we grew organically Correct. through that transition yeah. from investor to agent. Yeah. Yeah. So you got your license and then started working with the real estate license and making some cash that way. Selling investment properties, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, 2011, we had a website, you know, Hamilton was the place, could check it out, look at here's the neighborhoods we're like, and you know, it was all about investing. We were like crushing it in the Google, you know, our, all the organic stuff was like doing so well. It was like, nobody's doing this that bad. How did you learn about all that? Uh, when we had a music, we had a music business. And so I was doing Google ads back then in like 2006, 2007, we were doing Google ads for our, our wedding business. So we had, my wife did like, you know, violin sessions for the, you know, for the, for the wedding, oh, cool. the ceremony type stuff. Got it. Yeah. And uh, we would have a jazz band for the, for the cocktail thing. So I was dabbling in Google ads back then. And that was the introduction to it. And in 2011, it was like, let's make a website, um, for real estate investing in Hamilton. And, uh, yeah, I crushed. Like I had clients coming out of my awesome. wazoo. Like it was, it was. And is that how you kind of grew your team? You had more. Yeah, teams? I've had a various iterations of teams over the years. You okay. Know, really failed at like how do you? What's the model? Like how do you do this? Like oh my god, I gotta like support people. I gotta like coach people. What did we do here? Like I mean, just learning and failing along the way, right? Like just terrible at it. And you know, clients just floundering in the emails. Like they can You know, it was. Didn't like realize, all of us, like yeah. all of us, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize how good it was. Um, you know, when in retrospect, those those were really interesting times. You know, where wow, I found like a niche where nobody else is really playing, and it's I think and it was, was trending from data, right? That Don Campbell provided. I'm sure you were doing the same thing, and that being in that right position, you know, ahead of time, oh, was geez. so beneficial to. Building a oh my gosh, I feel so lucky. I got to ride the software trend yeah. from like 19. I started at Oracle in 1998 and then I left uh, software in 2007. Mm-hmm. So I had this like almost decade run there where it was just software was on fire. And around the year 2000, Nick and I started buying properties. And 2000. then 2000, yeah. Wow. And then, um, then we left, uh, I left software to start this and interest rates, great financial crisis where everyone said that's the worst time. You, you should not start what you're starting now. Let me give you some free advice. And we we're like, well, really? Um, we went and did it and interest rates dropped for like all the 2010s. Right. And we rode that. So it's not like, I think any of us are super smart that got into real estate. It's just like you get in and you happen to ride this trend. And if you right. do it with some knowledge behind right. you and you do it semi-intelligently, yeah, yeah. you can survive it and the trend just kind of carries you. I think it's why I'm looking at Bitcoin as much as I do, because to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the next Same great idea. trend. Right. Right. Let me observe this, learn about this. How do I participate in this for myself and my family and those around me? I think it could be beneficial. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but real estate was just that. Like it was like, we just all got in at this time where, you know, I, we were rain members. We could never go. I went to one meeting Remember because what? we were starting Rockstar. Yeah, you're rain members. Okay. And people, when we started Rockstar, people would come up to us and say, well, we're part of rain and you don't know what you're doing. We're like, I don't know. We're like, we're rain members. I've actually already owned real estate for like 10. My family's owned it forever and we flipped and been through it all. We've owned, Nick and I've owned, like, what are you talking about? We were just so busy heads down with Rockstar. We just couldn't do anything. We couldn't go to any meetings. We couldn't participate in anything. We were, like you said, you know, when you're floundering around, we were like, we were like struggling to survive. I quit my job with my wife at, you know, Carol was at home, mortgage on the house, two kids. Nick and I rented a closet at a Keller Williams office, like literally their old closet that they rented out as an office. You know, the ones where you keep the mops <laughs> <Yeah>. and stuff. <laughs> they turned that into a closet. That's what we could afford to rent. Yeah. People would, you know, come to the office to meet us and we would like run to the front. They had a little training room. So we'd kind of like meet them there. So, so they, they didn't see the office. Yeah. Like it wasn't <laughs> that embarrassing, but it was a little bit like. Slumming it, man. I, I think that's a, you know, gra- sure. grassroots move. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. You know, like just. And uh, then that office actually closed down. 
the Keller uh, Williams. That one, I know they've reopened since, mm-hmm. but um, that one closed down. So we were there at like 7.30 in the morning and somebody was banging on the glass door and it was the guys who were going to repossess the Xerox copier. Mm-hmm. You know those big Xerox <laughs> machines? They ran, we unlocked the door because we were already in. They bolted in right past us, grabbed the big Xerox machine, like rolled it out. Like I thought they were going to smash this thing into a truck and they're like, this place is going down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we're like, everything. holy shit, really? Mm-hmm. We didn't know. <laughs> And so we asked around quickly and apparently like things weren't going well. And uh, within 24 hours, we had a U-Haul truck. We had our two little desks, our printer, our voice over IP phone. Remember the voice over yep. IP phone? <laughs> and we uh, we got executive suites in Burlington. Was that the coffee office? That was the coffee office. That's when I just were at Okay, yeah. And we signed like that day. They're like, do you want to like think about it? We're like, no, no, we'll sign. And we sent an email out to all our clients, which was probably, I don't know, a handful, <laughs> you know. Great news. We have a brand new office in Burlington. We're so proud and honored to be here. And it was like the sandwich shop at the front and us with some like executive suite it, behind that's us. That's great though. Like, so when I, that's where, when I joined as a member, I came to the free training that was there and uh, I came on a recommendation of a RAIN member and met you guys. And I, I remember, I, I think I asked, it was either you or Nick. I said, you guys are RAIN members? You're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I'm a RAIN member too. And I'm like, I you gave your presentation and signed up, but it felt, it actually felt like a substantial office, even though there's such That's right. Cause so it was smaller. like a big, yeah. All we had was like a 10 by 10 office, office in the room. back, but yeah. we got to use that big, big space. space. Smart. It was all shared. It felt great. Yeah. yeah. Wild times, man. Times, yeah. Okay. So, and then how do you guys meet each other? Where does the, where did the pass cross here? It's real estate transactions. Yeah. It's strange. Yeah, We've okay. done a couple of deals together and then rain, I'm sure it was a part yeah, of it. And, and then I remember where? we actually had a few investor clients that weren't you know, with one agent or another, they were looking for good opportunities. I was trying to steal them. Yeah. yeah. So one one of my clients that. that I did a bunch of deals with, he found a good opportunity through Cam, put in an offer on Cam's property and then ended up, he couldn't close on it. And so I brought one of my clients in and we did the transaction. And so that's kind of how we first started chatting and then just kept in touch over the, the, the last years. Cause we were doing very, very similar things, servicing investors in, in Hamilton. Right. So also wanted to keep an eye on what he was doing because always want to learn from learn, what somebody yeah. else is doing. And then we just been chatting more over the last couple of years until, until last, kind of last summer. year. Yeah, this summer. And now you guys work together. As yeah, we we've, we've, we've merged two teams, essentially. You know, we've put two teams together to, you know, James is the operating. You mentioned integrator earlier. And it's nice to hear you acknowledge, you know, that in you. <laughs> it's good when somebody knows what they're good at. Why? What do you see in James? Well, integrator is, you know, I, you know, I sometimes Papa Smurf is, is the way I refer to James in, in my mind. Like he, he makes sure like he makes sure that people are, you know, under, like he's, he's connecting with people, right. Connecting with people on the team. And like you, you have a temperament for, you know, p- measured pace and implementation of of processes and systems and yeah, that was my thing before spreadsheets like i was a project I, I manager I live yeah. in spreadsheets yeah. as a project manager and building out processes so when we've got a gap and something's broken it's like how can i put something in place to fix it so that it never breaks again right so and then the piece that i don't have the background on is the marketing and and how do i and that's what cam brings to the table brings to the table that's what i bring to the table mm-hmm. yeah that's sort of my focus on the team is is lead generation and 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 all that stuff and as well like uh, supporting agents i can't help but like i think we have a very different you know my like i have a like i like therapy you know like that sounds really weird to say but like the idea of like developing yourself and having a growth mindset and and working on like you know what is blocking you like what is what is stopping you that's always been interesting to me you know that that (laughs) idea of like what is you know what is the thing that is um you know, what's the, what's that thing that unleashes your potential, right? That, that idea, you know, so that's, you that's, read personal development books growing yeah, books, up and I, I've done like a lot of, uh, I actually wanted to become a therapist at one point, like a psychotherapist. So I, I did, uh, um, I don't anymore. <laughs> um, but I, I, it's a fascinating world. Like I spent a time getting certified in internal family systems, which is a therapeutic mm-hmm. modality for, you know, uh, blocking certain, you know, belief structures and mental patterns and things like that. Um, you know, I've done a lot of personal development work going out to, you know, Philip McKern, I think, you know, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I've done a lot of work with him and, uh, spent a couple of years on retreats with him and, you know, doing like just workshops and like developing, you know, your vision. And I, I have a personal coach now we have a business coach, you know, and the mental coach I have right now, Danny Patterson is, so you have three coaches, uh, two, well, two. you okay. have one and I have of the business. One. So okay. I guess okay. I say I have two, but I really have one. Three. Okay. Oh, I guess, yeah. Um, 
so then anyway, the, yeah, the mental coach side of things has been really helpful for just keeping, you know, what's important in your life at the forefront of what, you know, you're doing in your life, you know, like, you know, f- you know, family, you know, like your, your business, keeping the things that, you know, moving in the right direction. Right. And, you know, we have a way of com- making things complicated, you mm-hmm. know, human beings and, uh, um, you know, at least I do. And so I need support on that. What is it in you that goes out of your way to pay for coaches in these areas? Like you, what conclude, oh my gosh, like this is going to benefit my life. So I'm going to spend that. Cause most, mon- most people aren't going to spend the money or the time to do this. So yeah, your thought question. process is, I guess, like I see, I have maybe some untapped potential in myself and it can be extracted by some assistance from someone else. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, athletes have coaches, you know, I, I had professors, you know, I had like, uh, I had a, t- I had a teacher, you know, guitar teacher. I always went to see teachers along my learning in music. And I th- maybe I've just kept that going. I don't know. I, actually, it's a great question. I don't. And how, you're, you're pretty happy with your life right now. I would say just watching you, what percentage of that comes from the assistance of investing in yourself? I guess like how much less satisfied would you be in your life if you didn't go down the personal development path? Can you like even pick a number at all? Or is that just too wild? It's hard for me to articulate yeah. that. I don't know. I mean, do you, do you work with anybody? Have you ever, have no. you ever gotten any, any support from any? Yeah. Like we paid any? for lots of masterminds and stuff. Yeah, yeah. not really working with anyone now. Um, but I think that's the thing, like whether it's a personal coach or whether it's a mentor or whether it's a mastermind, I think we all have people that we rely on to kind of bounce ideas off, totally improve mindset. And we've all pretty been self-driven in terms of personal development, whether it's reading books, whether it's, you know, taking online courses, mm-hmm. whatever it is, it's not just sitting still with where you're at. It's always self-improvement mm-hmm. and, and ongoing improvement of iterations of yourself. Right. I think the personal power, Tony Robbins, personal power Two CD set. I must have played. First of all, I think I had a ripped off copy of it that somebody made for me. So I don't think it was an original. <laughs> and it was, I, I listened to that on repeat. I think the thing is like 40 hours long or how I, I can't remember. It's, it's a like, million CDs. It's a million CDs. And I listened to that on repeat from like, I don't know, 1998, 2004, <laughs> like just in my car for 40 years. Programming. But yeah. 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 Just but I, I think I went through the years of like the age of 24 to about 28, 29 of just every morning, about probably 90 minutes of personal development, reading and work, which also include meditation. Cause I grew up, um, with meditation in our lives. Oh yeah. I think I've shared this before that our mom took us to a meditation camp when I was like about 13. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Toronto central library. Everybody else was going to like fun camps in Muskoka and stuff. And we went to, we went to, we were meditating and doing all these visualization work and getting your breath down and they would measure wow. your, the yeah, measure, what is it like beta and theta waves, like how low you can get your, uh, you, you know, how calm you can make yourself. And then yeah. the visualization work that you would do. And then they would do little exercises because we were young. It, w- it would be like just to convince yourself that the power of the mind was something that was, did exist. Um, they would do little things that really impressed me. And it was like picking a random time the next day to wake up. So it couldn't be like 6 a.m. or 6.30. You had to pick like 6.23 or something like that. And it started working. And I could do it every day in a row. And I could always change the time. So I could say like 6.47. And I would wake up at 6.47. So then I started to believe in the power of the mind. As silly as that sounds. Oh, no. Then it was like, wow, what is going on? And um, so we always grew up with visualization and our cool. mom was really into that. That's amazing. Our mom was like, I think even when we started Rockstar, I was telling people like in 20, before ayahuasca was like a thing, <laughs> um, our mom, who was, I guess, 60 at the time, she's like, oh, by the way, I'm going to Brazil into the jungle. Oh, um, and uh, I had never heard of ayahuasca before. This is maybe 2000. I don't know. This is early. Like I never heard of it. This is way before. If it, if it got trendy, this was before then. And uh, we're like, what do you doing? She goes, well, I got the shaman and I'm going to go into the jungle. And I'm like, how do we reach you? She's like, I don't think you can. I don't really know, but don't worry. I'll be fine. I'll I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And she goes down into the jungle. She has this great experience and uh, she comes back. So like, we've always just like, our mom's always been this like influence to us about like pushing herself for her her whole lives. And our dad was more just the worker. Brick and mortar. Yeah. Like get up, work hard. The drywaller. 
the drywaller. Yeah, yeah, don't ask for any help from anyone. Just work. But what a great balance. What a yeah. great. What a great. You know. What, yeah. What a great, I mean, yin and yang. That you, your your mom, sure. your mom and dad. Brought, yeah. Yeah. Know? It was a little bumpy along the way, but yeah, for sure. Are yeah. they still alive? They're both still alive. Yeah. Um. Through. I think it was. Uh. Yeah. I don't. I don't know, our mom might be listening to this at some point, but it was like the real estate crash of the nineties that ultimately I think led to their divorce. Okay. They split up. Got it. So like real estate yeah. to us, like when people say, Hey, real estate can only go up and only great things happen. It's like, to me, it's not just the price of real estate that can change. It's, it's, impact it's the impact on a family. They're back together now. <clears throat> oh, wow. Um, so that's um, a wild story. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, so the real estate crash of the nineties to us is really kind of, you know, that, I think that's why we're always just like really basic on real estate. Well, Get a nice little starter home, check the income, check the rent and vacancies in the area. If you're comfortable with that, buy it and hold it for a long time and that's it. Well, it's important to have that perspective too because if you're only looking at that, you know, a lot of people have only seen real estate only goes up prior to two years ago then you can get caught up in all these different things where if you've seen cycles and crashes and stuff like that, you know what can happen to people that aren't investing smart, right? So, and as Rockstar as a whole, the typically the coaching that they give as well as the coaches give is to focus on that stuff, right? Yeah, and when you think about it, it's 2024. So let's say 2023 was the first time the real estate market really shook in a long time. Mm -hmm. So for fifth, since 2008, it basically plateaued there for a little bit, then basically went up. So we're talking 15 years. Yep. So if somebody's 40 today, and they didn't really pay attention to real estate until they're 25. That means you can have 40 year olds who their whole lives, their whole adult lives, they just saw one thing, Yep. real estate go up. Totally. Yeah. So, you know, it's hard to even blame people who don't see it because you're like, that's all they've seen. You know, even the 2000s, it, it just went up slower, mm -hmm. but it really started going up in 1998 and then just kept going up at different paces. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not really just a localized thing. It's been, you know. COVID related and interest rate related, yeah. fiat related and just a systematic yeah. global debt. But I think okay. people who are yeah. going to survive it need that personal development aspect to it because it's, it's life is presents a lot of challenges and real estate's going to throw a lot of challenges to you. And if you're not ready to handle them, <laughs> I, I've been thinking a lot, like, you know, I've been doing like this, this box breathing thing. Yeah. Yeah. Know, have you ever checked yes. this out where yeah. it's like you inhale yeah. four seconds and then hold for four seconds and then exhale for four seconds. And I just heard about it last year. Seconds. Yeah. I've been using it a lot and it's like I do it three times a day and it's really working on maintaining my nervous system in, in, a, in a great for recovery. Um, I do a lot of jujitsu and when I recover from, you know, it helps with recovery. But I've been thinking it's like we need to almost be like, you know, we're like you have to be hyper. You have to be you have to be like a. You feel like a, you know, like a CIA agent or something with like these tools and tricks to like win in this world, Holy you know. And shit. like, I mean, especially for entrepreneurs. Like, I think if you've got a good gig and you're just hanging out and you've got your pension. Yeah. Yep. My brother's a pilot for Air Canada. Yeah. He doesn't, he's like, that's cool, man. Huh? Like you could, you yeah. I'm going to yeah, go, yeah. Right. go play some video games. <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. He's got his job it's, and you can't blame him. Right. It's, I think it's the world you find yourself in mm -hmm. like, where coaching is important to me because it's a part of Mm, that's a good Being way to a put performer, it. Yeah. You know, like I have to be in the performance mindset. I can't otherwise left to my own devices. I'm going to, I'm going to do some really dumb stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm going to just default to some bad patterns that I've, you know, inherited or I grew up with or. You How know. do you do the box breathing? Do you set a reminder on your phone or something? No, you said just, three times a day. It's like I try to just chill out, you know, like I probably need to do it right now. I get like all jacked. <laughs> you don't seem like you're freaking out. Right I know now. it's the surface thing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Cause I would need to, there's, remind. An app, there's an app that you can, I have a breathing could, app as well. I have yeah, an app yeah. too. And it's literally the box one is a box. There's like a line yeah. that goes on it and you yeah. breathe with the line. <laughs> it's so cheesy, but it seemed to work. So what do you do? Like you, you went to this when you were a kid and you did the meditation thing and like, have you, yeah, have you and then always, I could, it's probably been a seed plant. Yeah. Like when we like, started rockstar, I was rockstar. Like I was meditating on starting a business. I hate like James is, you know, but like both of your examples, I hated my corporate life. And I got to the point where I just started kind of visualizing one of my visualizations. This is going to sound cheesy, but uh, I thought 
if I could help investors, because I know real estate's a path to financial freedom, if I could just on a Saturday morning meet a bunch of people at Canadian Tire and get a bus and take them to Hamilton and show them the great opportunities, because I grew up in Mississauga, lived in Oakville, and all my friends in Mississauga, when you talked about Hamilton, at that point, I think that's all past now, but at that point it was like, Hamilton? Like, really? Mm -hmm. um, One of the like armpits it, of Ontario. Yeah, so I thought, oh, if I could just meet people at Canadian Tire on a Saturday morning, it's like the most ridiculous thing. Thing. get a little mini bus put a bunch of people on the bus and take them on a tour of properties around hamilton i think that would be like the greatest thing i could be doing what a trend and then it kind of like so. then rocks and then i remember thinking i studied marketing pretty deeply yeah i know you did i was getting really into it i started a bunch of websites did some affiliate marketing stuff i was getting checks from amazon i started a digital camera website hmm. that sent me checks for years in u.s dollars like it was the most brilliant thing and then i thought oh how can i apply this to real estate and if only i remember just thinking if only I could find somebody who had applied this these marketing strategies to real estate investors and I remember just thinking about that in the morning I remember sitting in my family room just like thinking about this and visualizing it and like how could I apply my marketing to real estate investing and one day I'm reading a Dan Kennedy newsletter and there's this paragraph this guy Rob Minton in Ohio is using direct marketing to work with real estate investors. I didn't even finish the sentence. I threw it down. I ran to my computer in the kitchen. I Googled him up. Next day I'm calling, I'm filling out all his websites. You know how you were keeping tabs on cam? I'm like, what's this guy doing? Okay. Eventually that led to, um, I think I got like a promotion right around then. So I, I forgot about it for a couple of weeks. You know, you get a promotion, you think everything's excited. excited again. And uh, then I realized that it really wasn't. I dug up his phone number, I just called him. And uh, he sent me some sales letters and I'm like, Rob, uh, I wanna do what you're doing in Canada and I need to come and visit you to like see it. I'm a visual person, like mm -hmm. I, I need to see your operation. And he's like, well, funny enough, I'm about to like sell my strategies for working with investors. Mm -hmm. And with that comes the uh, visit to my office. I'm like, uh, done. And I called Nick, I'm like, Nick, I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna quit my job. Are you in or out? I need to know now. <laughs> and Nick's like, shit, I'm in. I'm like, all right, perfect, dude. I'm going to Ohio next week. We're get ready. And we drove to Ohio. We stayed in the cheesiest motel you ever seen. Snow was coming under the door. I had to get a towel in the middle of the night and wrap it and like stuff it under the door because snow was coming under the door. And we went and visited this guy, Rob, and we looked around his office and we went on a tour with his coaches. And uh, we were blown away. I'm like, oh my gosh, like people are walking in here, working with, you're working with investors, you're teaching them about this like rent to own strategy. I mean, we can do that. And uh, we bought some stuff from him with all the money that Nick and I had, like every dollar. And all we used was like basically one ad, but it was worth everything we spent with, with Rob. And he's, we still keep in touch with him. He's a great friend, friend to this day. Hmm. And that was kind of like the birth of Rockstar. So it's a long way to answer Cam that like, mm -hmm. Meditation and visualization has been a big part of my life. But then when we started Rockstar, um, over time, I think I got away from like visualizing um, some new things. It was more just mm -hmm. visualizing the success of this business. Like, mm -hmm. I need to make this business. How do I? So it was focused on this. And yeah. now I think I'm re entering a time of my life where the last little bit, it's opening up again. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, okay, what, yeah. you know, yeah. what else can I be thinking and doing at a maybe a bigger level? This operation has lots to do and it's not perfect. There's way more things, but I, it's time again. And I have the capacity now with kids are a bit older. Yeah. I can now spend some time thinking about the next. Cool. Kind of evolution. Sorry, long answer. No, man. no. But for sure. For like 15 plus years, that's been the focus. And yeah. How can I improve, optimize, grow Ugh. Rockstar without, you don't have to worry about anything else. You have more than a full time, you know, 80 hours a week thinking about that. Stuff. Yeah. 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 So what, yeah. What, what, what's next? Yeah. I don't know, but I want to, uh, James, I want to figure out, um, I think I have some ideas. We're going to talk about it. Uh, Costa Rica. Yeah. So how did you oh, get so. now? there what was that decision because you spend i feel like for years now you've spent like a month in january it's been about six weeks a year six weeks a year down there what was that like was that a goal of yours that i want to buy a property out of the country and take my family there in the winter so it's funny to go back to visual visualization i took a course this goes back maybe 2014 and a lot of it was you know setting goals and ideas and i had a vision board and on the vision board was actually a bunch of things one of them was Yo hablo espanol, which is I want to speak Spanish. And then I had a picture of a property somewhere hot with a pool in the backyard. And that just kind of sat 
on the vision board for at least that was a good three years before I really even consciously thought about it. And then we went down in 2016 on a trip and we had, we had been on cruises and been to the Caribbean and been to all these other places. And like, we haven't really explored anything other than the all inclusives. And we were looking at what kind of made sense. And Costa Rica was one of those ones that ticked the box. Um, did a trip down there with a whole bunch of friends and family. Um, and then, uh, just happened to be we were uh there's a mountain at the end of our, our street in Haco in Costa Rica this was on the Pacific coast it's about an hour and a half from uh the, the airport in San Jose and uh I walked by a, a site that was being built under development and a big sign saying you know call here or email this email address so I emailed the guy um started talking to the developer started running kind of numbers as a real estate investor I, I would never have done it if I didn't have the real estate background, but understanding what materials are you using, what are your costs, what are my HOA fees going to be like, what is this whole development going to look like, is it a gated community as regard, all this stuff. And uh, he came out to meet me. He happened to be Costa Rican, but he's uh, he went to law school in Chicago, so he speaks fluent English. His brother's the architect. His family owned oh, wow. the land that they're developing. They own the land on either side. And uh, he's saying, I'm building these on spec. You know, I'm going to be selling them if you're interested. And so that was in like March. And then I, I pulled out my property analyzer spreadsheet and I ran a whole bunch of numbers, figure out if it made sense based on a whole bunch of unknowns and variables and 60% occupancy and all this stuff. What year was this? This was 2016. 2016. What, yeah. Why Costa Rica? Why did you, like, how did you get there? Did you just like put, put, we had put been, a pin on the map or something? been to Mexico. I'd been to a whole bunch of different spots in Mexico. We'd been to Cuba, been to Dominican Republic, been on cruises, you know, Jamaica, you know, all these different spots. Costa Rica was the only spot that we had been to where we felt like we just, the culture, we loved it. And that location specifically, like so friendly, everybody was so friendly, felt very safe, very family oriented as well. I uh, love the beach, love the proximity to the beach, temperature, all these different factors um, kind of made sense. And so that led me to look into whether purchasing made sense and uh, ran all the numbers. And we were the first time we, we ended up pulling the trigger and said yes, um, bought the property. And then this was crazy. I um, went down to get the keys. Right. And then it's we're the only ones that have purchased in this eight unit development gated community with a guard. So we're there by ourselves. No way. <laughs> the family. And we're like, nobody else lives here yet. It just felt really weird. And the second trip we went back and it, and it was there, a whole bunch more people had purchased. So now it's a, now we have friends, friends down there. We have like people that we like just can't wait to get to go see. Right. So, um, that's kind of been, that was the, the driving thing originally was as an investment. And now it's shifted to more of a, you know, it's our cottage for the, for the most part. And did you have to justify like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to spend this money down there. I don't know how the numbers are quite looking. Cause you said you're guessing a little bit, mm. this could buy me another rental property in Hamilton, right. but I'm going to choose to do this or no, based on the numbers you thought this is a no brainer. I'm going to proceed. So I've always talked about being an opportunistic investor. So for me, this will just look like another good opportunity. So from an investment standpoint, when it compared to something say in Hamilton, um, the down payment, because we were able to get financing through the builder, which helped a lot of the decision. I think if we were buying cash, it would have been maybe I wouldn't have made the decision to purchase proceed. But with 50% down, the numbers was less than a down payment on a property in Hamilton. Mm. And if I looked at the ROI it was very similar using really, I think I used like one or 2% appreciation. We've actually seen closer to five. He is pretty good at this cam. <laughs> He's right. pretty good at this. Yeah. He figured it out when we bought our place in Croatia. It was like, Oh, this feels good. I don't know. It's going to cost us like four properties in Hamilton, but I just got a feel about this i think we should proceed there, yeah, there was an, <laughs> there was an element of emotion as well as like yeah. this is going to be amazing we have a place down there we go place to, to go to that we can rely on having everything we awesome. need at our fingertips awesome he's balanced he has yeah. he has the feeling and the yeah. and, then he, and the then spreadsheet he backs it up yeah there was yeah. definitely some emotional decision about also the fact no one likes to admit it but saying yeah i own a place in costa rica that was a kind of a cool factor to mm -hmm. all the sure. other so there's a yeah, looking yeah. good aspect to it. yeah <laughs> look at my t-shirt guys uh you're gonna ask me where i got my t-shirt here <laughs> guess where i got this t-shirt cam he walks in i'm like dude that's a cool t-shirt where'd you get it oh it's costa rica i live you know i buy all my clothing in costa rica just now in case you forgot yeah <laughs> back there next week <laughs> he leaves on friday yeah i'm going back on friday wait you you go to his place so, you have a place though. so check this out so okay, I, we I, haven't talked about this i've been oh. going to costa rica since 99 no yeah like going there to just to surf like my first trip was with my brother and his his pilot buddies and it was just it was insane we'd drive through rivers with the surfboards and like big waves coming over our car with going, running through rivers and like launching off so ramps cool. and riding bowls and it was like the 20s right um 
so we've been going down there to surf and I've been going there almost yearly, maybe, you know, um, for the last 24 years. And, uh, as I've gotten better in my surfing, like that's my whole thing is the ocean. I love the ocean. So being down there to surf as I've gotten better, I've, I've come down, I've discovered that this region called Hako and Hermosa beach is where the best waves are in the whole country. It's just the most consistent surf in the whole country. And if you want to learn to surf, if you want to, like, if you're an intermediate surfer and you want to get better skills, you need good waves to do that. And when you travel, you want, like, you want to get waves on that trip, right? And that's always the, the toughest part. So we've been going to this. Because you knew you were going to get the waves. You knew you were going to get the waves. Just, and, and I've got people down there who, you know, who introduced you to the waves. And, and I've met friends. I have t- Costa Rican friends and other friends down there. And it just so happens to be the place where James owns a property, right? Holy so he, shit. So he's yeah. down there all the time. I'm down there all the time. You know, I've, we've been, we've got some plans for development down there now, like building a home. Like that's where we're just about to build, um, a, a rental, pro, uh, a, a villa on the Hills in the Hills of Hermosa. That's our, oh wow. uh, that's the next step for it's about 10 minutes from my place. Awesome. We're just about to pull the trigger on that. I have a, a partner that, uh, is very interested in just, so you have to buy the lot like land there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Buy the lot. And, uh, that's, I mean, I've been researching Costa Rica real estate for years, but really seriously for the last year. And it's just so cool that like, you know, you know, we're, we're in business together to our two teams or we have, we have a, we have a merged team and, and we've got these great people on our team that we're so we, we love. And, and he's got this place in Costa Rica and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm in the same location. It's just like the weirdest synchronicity. Shit. Way, that's wild. Of, yeah. In the world. Yeah. Of all the places in the world, we happen, happen to, be to be there focused on the, for different reasons too. Right. Like I'm there for the surf. And, and the culture and the life. James there for the t-shirts. James. <laughs> yeah. And don't get me wrong. I like surfing. I'm just not good at it. So yeah, yeah, I get you. I, I haven't I'm, given I'm, it enough time. I've been out twice. It's surfing is just one of those like most difficult sports. So like, mm-hmm. you know, it's cool. like, so like, do you think you're going to spend more and more of your time there outside of Canada or split it equally? Like moving there is in the car. Like that. Oh, really? That's the, I, you know, mm. my, my wife has to agree to this, of course, but mm-hmm. we're, we're in the process of getting, looking at that, but that, that's, yeah, I mean, moving there is definitely in the cards for us, like in the next you know, few years. Uh, hmm. You know, when I, when I'm in uh, Croatia on the water there and stuff, and I have relatives and, and some family still mm-hmm. there, I feel this sense of calmness. Like I feel like I mm. belong. It's okay. so weird. Like yeah. it's like I'm born in Canada, Yeah. but I just feel like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know. I feel just a sense of being at home or something i can't even describe it so do you get that kind of feeling in costa rica like you just feel like this is your place yeah recently like over the last few years as as ontario has begun to uh, i say get sick like Mm -hmm. i think culturally there's a sickness so you can see it i mean it's everywhere yeah and, and it's just become like the the, di- the what is it like the, the divergence or mm-hmm. the dichot- I don't know like the difference between the two is so it's becoming grown. so stark right mm. so now like when you go to Croatia I'm pretty, I bet you it feels oh. does it feel like even more or maybe you know, because it's weird because it was an old communist country that feels more free yeah to me like I feel like the People there are more free. They can speak freely. Everyone's yeah. being themselves. Yeah. They're still complaining about life and stuff, sure. about their pensions are no good. and stuff, But it's just, yeah. there's a lightness. I don't know, to yeah. me, the way I'm experiencing it, because I believe some people could live there and have a completely different experience. But the way I'm experiencing it, it's just a little bit of a lightness to it that's yeah. different here. I agree. And I think um, Hako specifically, because it is such a big surf community, that this the mindset of people that come down it's like there's it's not about it's about you know enjoying life and that hako has so much to offer too so it's about just hanging out and there's not as much like we're so focused on entrepreneurship and go 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 and not mm-hmm. just, you know, sitting back and actually appreciating what you've got lately i've been telling everyone canada is a work camp yeah that's a <laughs> you come here <laughs> you're it's a work camp that's it. you get your place to sleep mm-hmm. you work you pay a crap load of taxes you get some services they're right kind of like getting crappier over the years but it's this work camp and then you have to find somewhere else to kind of go and like live and i know that's maybe a horrible way to say like i have kids born here right so yeah. like i have roots here so i don't i don't say these things lightly but i do mean it deeply what, that this is a work camp yeah, it's, <laughs> you know? and, and you're like you know susceptible to what you're around all the time like the culture you're in oh. influences you whether you know it or not you, you can't it's like the fish the, the frog in, in the pot right we don't know we're 
you know, that, you know, when you go to Costco and everyone's pushing a little harder and grinding and no one's really smiling and not looking at each other, you know, like that. that well, and then you go to Costa Rica and everyone's like smiling yeah. and the food is good and the fruit's delicious like, and the, fr the fresh air and you're surfing and you're like, what the heck? Outside you almost outside. need that. You need a trip outside of an all-inclusive. You need to go live. Oh, 100%. Yeah. You know, you need to go see a place because if most, many Canadians will just go to all inclusive sure. through no fault of their own, no. that's what they can afford. It's a great trip. I'm going to an all inclusive March break. Like, this, I'm not, I'm not yeah, kind of shitting on it. It serves its purpose. Yes. But once you get into the culture of a place, then you ref, you can compare it to your point to Canada yep. and you realize, oh my gosh, like, Yep. What I've thought about living outside of Canada maybe is not the way it actually is living outside of Canada. And um, it's, I don't know, it's a great feeling to, to have these realizations. Work, work camp is a great analogy. Unfortunately, <laughs> that, that is like, you know, how it kind of feels like. And people don't prioritize things mm -hmm. in in Latin American countries and European countries. My wife's European. It's the same kind of culture. Like she's yeah. in Poland. It's like. There is much more appreciation of, of uh, time with people. And, Community, and they're the, singing, there's yeah. food, they're like, it's just yeah. a whole different life. Yeah. Their lives revolve around the family and the community mm -hmm. and eating together and hanging out. Don't They don't revolve around their career. Their career is mm -hmm. like this other thing. Right. Like it doesn't even matter. You, who even are if, you is like not your career. It's like, oh, yeah. it's my interests. And it's, yeah, it's, totally. Yeah. So where do you think then, do you think that you'll be outside of Canada for a majority of the time? If mm -hmm. you, yeah. yeah, I haven't figured out how to make that, like, you know, what are the implications mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Like, sure. In terms of like leaving Canada for after six months, you know, you lose, mm -hmm. what do you lose your healthcare? But there are private healthcare options in Costa Rica and in, in all, in any country. Oh, so you might even stay beyond six months a year. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's, wow. We awesome. Wanna, I, I want a home base in Costa Rica. Uh, and then Mexico, we have residency in Mexico. we got, so we're three, we have three year residency there. We're going to have permanent residency there. So home base in Costa Rica have Mexico as like kind of the, 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 the drier climate, you know, that, you know, we can go to, we uh, got it. And then Portugal is the third, like these, this is the vision. Shit. Cam, I'm, I'm I didn't know you were, I'm, I'm, you are visualizing. I'm birthing the vision out loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's. And why Portugal? Uh, like a Europe, it's like, it's got that European culture. So you've been. Uh, yeah, we've been. We've been to Porto a long time ago. We, okay. You know, but not... I, I was just in Lisbon last year with okay. Ruben. Cool. And I loved it. Yeah. Our wines were... Uh, like, I'm I'm big on the wines. So I'm yeah, like, holy yeah. shit, you guys have amazing wine. I had, you do a shit job of marketing Portuguese wine, but these <laughs> wines are amazing. Yeah. I was having a great time in Portugal. Yeah. We were out on the coast in Albufeira, Lagos. Mm. beautiful place this town lagos on the on the okay yeah, i feel like there was a lot of surfing up the coast in there's, portugal there's, there's, i can't remember the names of the town okay but there's i haven't been to the surf towns there oh is but it, i'm sure they're really i know they're really oh cool just the, the fresh there. fish and like yeah. i was sold on the place it was and it, it wasn't expensive it was great so then cam and, and I, i'm just curious You've been through this journey. You're born in Canada? Yeah. Yeah, Burlington. Born in Burlington. Go through this journey. Musician. You spend a lot of time on personal development. You mm -hmm. get into real estate. And then, like, what do you think is the most fulfilling way for you to live the next few years? Like, what is your purpose going forward? Is it to create this home base out of Canada? Is it to provide for your family is it uh mm -hmm. to make people think a certain way or feel a certain way like what yeah, thanks man that's a great question i love it it's a wonderful question it, it, it for me it's pretty selfish serving i i want to be by the ocean it's been you know that's sort of where i feel best it's by the water and living in the rhythm of with the ocean nearby and i don't you know other than it's not that ambitious like i'm going to change the world with my my plans it's just simply you know, it's a self-serving, uh, that's where I feel at my best. Like that's where I feel most, uh, the best version of Cam Carroll is when I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I have the ocean nearby, I'm, I've been in it. It might be self-serving, but you <clears throat> living the best version of yeah. yourself serves the people around you. 100%. Very true. Yeah. So I think it's like, you know, my daughter's 15, she loves the ocean too. And you know, if you're not fulfilling yourself in your life, you know, like fill your cup up so you can fill other people's cup up, right? Like, I, you know, you like, I could, it would be maybe more responsible to stay in Canada and let my daughter have opportunities. Like there's this, this side of me mm -hmm. that does that, right? That talks like that. But it's like, you know, my daughter's going to look at me and say like, you know, I know what my dad loves. And like, if he goes and does that, like, that's a great example. I think, I think that's the example I want to set is like, go do what you love. Go, f you know, be self-expressed in your life. And, uh, 
What skills do you think the next generation are going to need or are going to be important to them? Or is it just that more people should spend time having the realization (laughs) that they need to be happy and live in a happy way? Like, what do you think the next generation needs to hear from you on how to live the best? These are big questions, Tom. I got right. I'm not saying you're gonna have the right answer. There's okay, no cool. right as answer. As you're not no, okay. just I'm just curious. I feel like you're someone who's thought about this. Well, I, I mean, university is not. I don't think is really that. I think like you know, diving into the. Like I think you know, I think it's more important to be grounded in, you know, who you are as a human being or what you're. You know, I think it's more important to be grounded in relationships and and and. and Everyone's different though, right? Like everyone's got their different skill sets. So it's hard to like yeah, make it like for everybody. Yes. I, yeah. In my network and my family, the way we operate, Mia is somebody who will thrive in a, in a community, in like a relationship based, um, you know, Mia's your wife or your my daughter, daughter. daughter. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, if, if universities on your, on your mind, amazing, go for it, but it's not like the end all be all. Like, I don't think success derives from your, this, this, this strong pathway. I don't know. Like, I think diverging from the norms is important in terms of like raising, and I mean, our philosophy on, on, mm-hmm. on, on, you know, kid develop, you know, child development or whatever is like, she went through Montessori schools and like, you know, just, you know, I don't know. It's like human, humans are better at like being, you know, if they have a creative sense side to them, you know, like humans are, are, are good at like, get out of the, you know, be free with your choices. I think mm-hmm. choose freely. I think ultimately what's come down to, and that's very vague. I'm sorry. That's, no, that's I don't like, think there's like a, <laughs> no, there's no a, good answer or right answer. It's or it's to, every, it's a tough question. Yeah. I think diverging from the norms, what you said there is pretty yeah. important. Don't follow what everyone else is doing at a bare minimum. Maybe. That's going to be a path to like, yeah. Surf them. Well, I saw yeah. something recently too, that talked about the commoditization of education and stuff where if everyone's learning the same things, then there's nothing to differentiate you from anybody else in Hmm. anything you're doing, right? So it's more about the soft skills and building relationships and understanding what value you can bring to to other people as well. And sure, there's going to be an element of things that you need to learn and stuff. But like Cam says, if you can figure out what you want to do, what your self-drive is, as well as Hmm. figuring out what your relationships and how to, 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 to nurture those, I think you can do whatever you want. How did you come to that realization? That's pretty good, James. Mm, he's good. I told you. I, I consume a lot of content, uh, but no, I'm trying to remember where it's from. But um, I just see the people that are graduating. You see the stories of kids that are graduating from school, mm-hmm. and it's like I've got a bachelor's degree in psychology, and mm-hmm. none of them. And I think of my own personal experience. I got a bachelor's degree of biology. I have a psych degree. Right. So and <laughs> see where it got you. Yeah, looks pretty good. <laughs> and I, I think the value from the education piece was in the experience, not in what I learned. Yeah, is going through that and learning what I, I learned. Right. So, but I think now we're in a different age where you don't need to go to university to do that. And you can, the, the stuff that you need to learn, you can find on a million different websites or YouTube or whatever it is to learn that, but you need to get physically in and, and being with people. Cause I see social anxiety in so many young kids, kids, my daughter included. So my daughter's uh, 13 turning 14. Mm. My niece is the same. My nephew's the same. Like they're so focused on screens and even with mm. COVID on that remote yeah. learning, they just, the interaction for people like, trying to get one of them cam and i had this conversation trying to get one of them to go up to the to buy a a donut at tim hortons like they just they can't Mm -hmm. deal with talking to a human being yeah and i and i'm like i don't remember that as a kid at all right we just everyone would just do that stuff and i think it's getting worse in these generations because they're so focused on being behind a screen and you're safe Mm -hmm. i mean i never thought about it that way yeah tom you know like the your bitcoin obsession i have have one too Mm -hmm. and james i'm glad to know there are others of us there are are, are (laughs) others i mean we met at the bitcoin conference (laughs) let's remember that in canada (laughs) you know i think that like the root of if you get it comes down to the like the what's the root of like you know like it's this idea of like being able to borrow from the future and create you know, all of this abundance from the future and somehow that's related to what you're talking about, but around, around kids and like, you know, it's, I don't know, man, you just got to get back to like good food, exercise, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, like surf, be re- responsible with, you know, your, your, your money and in turn, but it's like the game we have to play in order to, 
Yeah, it's unfortunate that as the money has broken down in society, it trickles and has these second order effects and all these other things. And everyone's kind of looking around and going, why is everything a little bit off? And some people like me maybe are a bit too extreme with it where I say, why is everything so fucking shit? Mm -hmm. Right. But you're uh, just saying what people are thinking, uh, putting it. Yeah. And then I think some people will say, Tom, well, things aren't that bad. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'd rather be real here. Like from the time I was a kid to now, if I look at healthcare, education, transportation, Mm -hmm. Canadian media, like all these different things, worse, 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 worse. I think. And then someone then will come back to me and say, well, Tom, didn't your parents or people that were older in when you were a kid say the same thing? And I'm like, that doesn't make, but even if they did, it doesn't make what I'm saying less right. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It, Maybe it, they're just, it, they just haven't. Like, if that's the case, then why do we? Ha- what, what's where's the end game of this erosion of? And we quality? meet in this business like you guys do. You, how many Canadians do you meet that just can't save? Mm-hmm. They can't save any money. And I feel like as a family unit, if you can't save, then you can't take these trips to Co- Costa Rica and you can't find maybe your truer self and you can't do all these other things. You're kind of trapped in this cycle of working to pay the bills, pay your taxes. You can't get ahead. And it just destroys the soul of so many people. And I think that's what I like in Bitcoin is that it presents this other financial system that is emerging next to the existing one that I'm like, holy shit, if we all just go and spend time over there, it's going to give us the freedom that we have since lost with this whole fiat thing. Yeah. And it gives me kind of hope. Yep. So like my, my personal angst or frustration with a lot of things is only because I, I when I step back, I, that's what I see. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I think some I people I irritate with that, but I don't fucking care. I don't know. I had a good. <laughs> yeah. I had a good conversation with a friend over the weekend, and Bitcoin came up, and I was telling. It doesn't matter what he's like. It's a scam, and so that was the initial argument, and so then we I kind of got into it with him, and and it was just head against a brick wall, right? So, and I'm like, at, at some point, there's certain people that you just can't explain it to. But to go back to your point, like I went back to try and explain just inflation. You talk about savers, even people that are successful at saving. And I'm like- They're getting robbed. Your $100 is going down by 2% in your bank account every year, at least 2%. If you go to, oh, yeah. you know, back to COVID, you're seven, eight, whatever the un, unreleased percentage of inflation is, right? Sure. But those concepts are, you know, they're just foreign to so many people. Yeah. And if you ignore it, it just is eroding all of your your purchasing power, yeah. all of the money that you're trying to save. Even if you are a good saver, even if you are good financially at figuring out how to not spend every penny that you're earning, like still those people are going to lose. Actually, you're saying it in such a good way because a lot of those personal financial books are like, hey, don't buy the coffee at Starbucks. Instead, save that money. So if somebody kind of, quote unquote, suffers and doesn't buy the things they want to buy and saves, if they don't save in the right vehicle through inflation or the debasement of the currency, they're still going to get robbed. So they're doing all that. And I think that's where it's like, I want to bang the mic against the table going, this is fucking bullshit. Like somebody's doing all the right things. And at the end of 20 years, they're going to look around going, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Why am I really not ahead? Mm -hmm. And to your point on the 2%, the, the way I like to measure it is on M2, the money supply, because inflation or the prices of things will change at different rates. But if you just look at the entire money supply in Canada, the percentage of Canadian dollars that you own measured against M2 is kind of like your ownership of the money supply in Canada, and that represents your purchasing power. But if the M2 money supply is getting debased, and I did this from 2000, the compound average growth rate of M2 in this country is 6.94 or 8.9. I, I forget the exact decimal point. Let's round it up to seven. seven. It's 7% a year. Mm-hmm. It's getting debased. So your percentage of the money supply is getting debased at 7% it's a insane. year, which is absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. So if you're not at least earning with your investment 7% a year, or your, compounded. Or your wage is going. Or your wage is going, you're just kind of falling behind. Even if you're reading all the financial books and doing everything right and like buying an index fund and doing all these wonderful things, you still aren't getting ahead if you're not beating that 7%. And yeah. if you're getting eight or nine, you you know you think you're killing it. Squeezing by. You but know, you're just, yeah. Like I think when you, I like, I think it's so great that you post that stuff and, and you, 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 you've extrapolated that detail. Like it's, it's so powerful for me to hear that. And when I, when like when we talk about it right now, it's like, my God, like they're, you know, creating these extra units and they're, they're, they're 
you know, systematically eroding our ability to. Uh, well, they're stealing thrive. from my family. They're, as Jeff Booth would say, they're they're stealing. It's, steal- it's they're, theft. Yeah. It's complete theft. And I right. think it, I was just going to say, like, I don't know that, you know, it, that it, you know, the, the average person is going to get that. I guess it's just a slow trickle ero- erosion process eventually over time. I think there's more and more people understanding this and demanding differences. But I right now, and you know, our, politically, our, our, you know, the, the tides are turning out there. Right. Like, I mean, in terms of like. But I don't think any government's going to do it any differently because maybe it's going to be a little more tight. How can they? The system they're, collapses they, if they change it. Exactly. Anything. They, their jobs are on the line. They're the whole system, like the healthcare system. All the systems are attached to this inflationary. Never and to me, expect. that's like the shame. Like that's the just it. it it's so depressing in, when you think about it, because even if someone does understand it, they might not have enough units of dollars to save and to convert into something like a good piece of income real estate that will protect their purchasing power Mm -hmm. or Bitcoin because they're just trying to pay the bills. So somebody I'm sure could be listening to this cam and go, yeah, thanks guys. I fucking hear what you're saying. I got to pay the bill. I got a car payment and I got a family. I don't have any, any extra dollars. And to me, that's kind of the, the, the shame of it all. Well, I think that's where psychology comes in or the like self growth or development. Like if you don't have, the income you somebody does who doesn't have the skills so develop the skills to you know and i think that's be, be on that's the, a good way to put it be on the other side of the equation for somebody like there's three resources time money and uh what's the third one uh time money and uh, i don't know Cam. maybe it's only two <laughs> maybe it's just time, <laughs> but time money and skills. Skills. skills okay sorry yeah, another resource so it's there's three resources have have one of the two of those time and skills or money and time or time and, or, you know, skills and money or whatever, you know, like that's be, a good way to put it. Because if you can, I, I feel like all of us here picked up some skills that yeah. the market rewarded yeah. and that was able, we were able to generate enough income to have the ability to save and to buy some other assets. So you do need to develop your skills. So that is a better way to say it, that like you, right. you can get ahead if you don't have the time or money, work on your skills early in the morning, late at night, aside from whatever career you have, if you're not developing, developing them in that career mm-hmm. and your skills then that you develop, pick the ones that the market is gonna reward. That's why I focused on sales and marketing mm-hmm. because I wasn't a lawyer, I wasn't an accountant, I wasn't an engineer. I was like, holy shit marketers get rewarded, salespeople's get rewarded. I better develop these skills and that generated enough income for me to start being able to pick up some properties and kind of save in that way. So yeah, mm-hmm. Cam, thanks. You're kind of saving me there. You, you, you're you giving me some hope. You're giving me hope. But you, I see that keep, example keep too. Moving. When you talk about, you know, most a lot of people ask why do joint venture partners even happen and it goes back to that same triangle right there's a lot of people that have the money and have maybe some skill or only money and they want to work with the person that has the time and the expertise right so they'll give you their money to invest mm-hmm. in exchange for you having that skill so that's i mean yeah i mean that's where that's our, the, the our business model in Costa Rica it, right? comes from is is provide people who want to spend time down there in costa rica because of the healing nature and the great people uh, that's a resource that you can't create from like a yep. fiat system. You can't create good people and, and nature. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful thing about like a country's, you know, I don't know Canada. Canada's got some beautiful places. Why can't we do that? I don't know why, <laughs> but anyway, Canada seems to have lost that, mm-hmm. that, um, that good people part. I, I hate to say that out loud on a podcast, but it's like, there is a, or uh, there's a sickness, I think, in our culture. It's the second I'm saying. Yeah, I think it's just a, the, the system that we are running in this country just happens to produce these things around us that make mm. it difficult to really kind of enjoy life the way you want yeah. to enjoy it. Um, Fair enough. We're, um, so, like, what are you guys? You're working with investors in the Hamilton area yep. actively. Yeah. Um, Hamilton. Is Brantford, that your focus? It both both use it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What other cities? Brantford, St. Catharines, Burlington will kind of extend out. And you think going forward, those areas have appreciation in them? 100%, yeah. Um, and is there, you know, I was just talking about this with somebody about uh, the US, and we were saying that like, Canada's weird in that like we get a lot of this immigration in the highest, I think in the G7 per capita still to this day. We have bonkers compared to the- <laughs> Yeah, and then we don't have very many big cities. Right. So what happens is we get this like forced extra appreciation in a place like the Golden Horseshoe, because if you go into the States and they get a lot of people, they don't get as much appreciation per capita as we do, but they get a lot of growth, let's face it. Mm -hmm. But you have all these cities 
Like every state, like you got New York and Florida and Texas yeah. and Arizona, you know, Illinois, you got all these different places, California, and people can kind of spread out. And there's a lot of fairly big cities. But in Canada, when you get all the people that Three. come in here, yeah. you're going to go to Vancouver. Alberta definitely is always like Alberta's always on off, you know, kind of goes with the oil a little yeah. bit. But it definitely has had, had a lot of interest uh, lately, for sure. But then there's, you know, Montreal in Quebec, and then there's Ontario. And Ontario gets 44% of all the immigration in this country, and a big part of that comes to the Golden Horseshoe. So it just, it's this weird thing as real estate investors that I've never really spent a lot of time thinking about. I'm like, holy shit, we get this appreciation just because there's not that many places to go. So like all the population just swarms into this one area, and it pushes places like Hamilton, which I think it will continue to push, and gets this like juicy appreciation number forward because not only is the currency making things appreciate through the devaluation of the dollar, but you get this like structural supply demand shortage because of all the people arriving here. And it's just kind of drives this real estate market. It's really weird. And then you got the developers that are building, especially from a single family home standpoint, permits are way down because yeah. it's not profitable for them too, right? So most of these people that are the immigrants that are looking for housing are coming in to resell. They're not buying new construction, especially right now because it's not being built. So how do you work with new investors who say, hey, okay, James, I'm brand new to this. Um, I want to get into real estate investing. Where do you start with them? So, we, I mean, we have the, I mean, in an individual investor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have a standard kind of onboarding discussion, right? So it's a, it's a goal setting exercise. It's a, you know, what do you want real estate investing to do for you first off? And then ask them kind of what, what are their overall goals and then goals in real estate. Some people have a specific piece of real estate they want to buy, whether it's a student rental, single family home, duplex, triplex, something with a garden suite. And some have no idea. Most don't. I mean, you think about it, keep it simple, right? Yeah. In the beginning, which we're really focused on right now is like the simplicity is the way to go you know like uh keep it boring like we started this conversation yeah. off with like simple and boring is is something because some people will start off with that mentality of i want to do everything like my i started off with a triplex right if i go back i wouldn't have done that i would have started off with single family home or maybe even a duplex but it's making sure they're understanding the fundamentals and doing making the right decisions for them right because somebody that comes to us with you know, a million dollars in the bank and wants to buy a Toronto condo that's going to be cash flow negative. It's very different from somebody that's barely saving a couple hundred bucks a month and wants to buy the same thing. We're saying that's not the right solution for you. You probably should be buying something that's cash flow positive, right? Because everyone's got a different end goal. Mm -hmm. So we'll do the analysis on it, every investor independently. Yeah. It's available now. You guys are a powerful team, man. I'm, I'm feel fortunate that you guys cross paths and that I get to chat with you, man. Powerful. Uh, Appreciate ditto. you, man. Yeah. So if anyone, uh, if anyone wants to reach out to you, how, what's the best way? Is it like through Instagram, website? Email? So we've got magsmccarroll.com is our uh, our team website, but individually it's just James at Mags McCarroll and Cam at Mags mm -hmm. um, Instagram is at Mags McCarroll and then we have our own independent ones, but most of our content is on the Mags McCarroll uh, Instagram. I do a Friday fun find where I'm checking out properties almost on, on a weekly basis every Friday, kind of sharing what I'm seeing in the markets, whether it's some crazy toilet randomly in the middle of a room or whatever it is, just to try and show people what's out there. Because I find that as I've been in real estate for almost 14 years now, and I still love going to check out properties. So I want to kind of share a little bit of that, of that enthusiasm on what we see and why I like the properties. The property tour to me is every house is unique. So there's always something interesting to share and to, to find. So we have property tours on a monthly basis for investors. So they can come out to walk through investment properties with our team and, and you know, get that simple, boring idea, right? Don't make it too complicated. And especially for new investors, uh, there's cash flow available. Um, you know, listen to what you guys put out on your economic stuff all the time. And, you know, lots of the different content that you can educate yourself around as a single family home. So being, you know, this hot commodity that's going to be there for, you know, I mean, Oh, we, we know the to me it's the on. unicorn. The single fa can you imagine a single family home in Hamilton right now or in any of the areas you're mentioning? It's just like the unicorn going forward. Mm. Investors ten years from now, if they look back, they're on people today. They're going to ten years from now. People will say, "Oh my gosh!" Like if you own a single family home in these areas, right. how did you do it? How was that even possible? Like that's coming. Yeah, you know, I, I know we we got to wrap, and I'm not sure we have a ton of time, but. This little, this one topic I want to talk to you about, yeah, yeah. which is we have time, which is the idea. Thank you. The idea of, um, you know, like this investor culture that we have in in Canada. Um, 
you know, investor, people owning homes is kind of the, historically what people have always done. Like it's a Canadian thing, right? Totally we have to be yes. owning a home yeah, yeah. and it's changing. Like it's going to be more European. I think it, it, maybe it evolves that way. Toronto's changing for sure. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I think we're evolving into a more of a renter society. I don't think that's controversial to say that at all. Um, what was my question? I know I completely forgot my question, but it was the something. investor culture. Yeah. No, something around maybe the investor culture, like, you know, um, yeah, maybe, you know, like people don't maybe want to become an investor because of the, the, the demonization of, mm-hmm. of what it means to be, you know, there's so much, you know, yeah, there's baggage so much with baggage it. around mm-hmm. like it's so much nonsense in the, you know, cause around. somebody's uneducated in it. If they, if they, if you tell someone, Oh, I'm a real estate investor, the response that you could get is like, Oh, you're part of the problem. There's you're, that, there, you're part of the problem. You're yeah, yeah. grabbing these properties right. and you're causing the prices to go up. You're the problem. Like for somebody who wants to get into real estate investing for the first time or some sort of asset class, whether it be Bitcoin or, 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 or stocks or, or real estate, you know, the baggage around real estate can, can stop people. Oh, I, I should, for sure. I shouldn't do that. Yeah. The people, people hate on me. They'll think mm-hmm. I'm a greedy landlord and a slumlord or something like that. Right. Like that narrative has to be fought constantly and, and, and geographically too. Like, I think like the narrative that Southern Ontario is just this terrible idea mm-hmm. as though homes won't be lived in, in the future <laughs> mm-hmm. or that there won't be growth of some kind in this, like you mentioned this, the, the people moving to this area. Like, I think we have to like, we have to kind of create like, you know, get the truth out there about it. And I think the truth is that like, there's a viable strategy in, in any market. You just have to, you know, agreed. You have to, you have to like parse out the nonsense and the noise and just really just, I've been hearing that there were Canadian real estate market. Like I think one of the first student rentals we bought around the year 2000 at Mac, um, people were telling us, Oh, like that opportunity is over. Right. Because I think the the older gentleman we bought the property off of for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, he bought it for sixty, and I think he made just a comment like like a bit of a flipping comment like yeah, oh the, the opportunity th- this is it's done yeah you know and I remember telling Nick we definitely got ripped off like you screwed us you <laughs> you are the worst negotiator because two hundred fifty are you kidding me like the guy just told us this is a rip off why did we even buy this. And then going forward now, it's like a million dollar property or whatever. We've refinanced it a couple of times, bought other properties. It's cash flowed every single day from day one. Yeah. It's had no vacancies. And then you get around 2007, great financial crisis. And people are like, the real estate market's over. I had somebody in 1998 tell me, a friend of mine, Tom, real estate, real estate's gone up now for two years because it went down from 90 to 96. Then it started turning, it went up and they're like, it's about to go down again. Like you realize the game's over. Right. So this is 98. Right. So I think just every yeah. era, and it's funny, new investors are actually sometimes easier to work with. 100%. Because they don't have that history of yep. knowing what prices were. They're whereas, so, Yeah, so some investor, James, that I'm sure, and Cam, that you've worked with, if they bought a property in Hamilton around 2010 for like $250,000, and they look at prices today, they're like, holy shit, game's mm-hmm. over. But someone new is just looking to solve the problem today. Yeah. Part of the reason we did rent to own really early was interest rates at that time, they, they went into the five, so it was like 5.8, 5.9, it was very similar to, to today. And we're like, how do we get slightly higher mm-hmm. than average rent? And how can we get some more money up front? Yep. So we thought, well, let's do this rent to own thing. So you can always match a real estate strategy, which is the cool thing about real estate. Right. You can match a real estate strategy to the economic cycle that you're in. Right. Because then we went away from rent to owns because they started appreciating and rents went up that for there's a brief time, people could just buy a home and rent it out because rent started going up so quickly and you could just do straight rent. And then that kind of expired. And then you had to do like duplexes and stuff. Yeah. Right. And then the last few years, it's barely been student rentals are on fire. So real estate's kind of interesting, especially a single family home. We've had one single family home that's we still own today that has been a rent to own. The person got a new girlfriend. They wanted to move, so he didn't buy from us. We turned it into a student rental for like seven or eight years. Now it's a single family home straight rental. So it went from rent to own to student rental to single family home uh, rental for one family. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the beautiful thing of real estate. So there is a lot of kind of opportunity. It's always evolving for sure. I have a similar story, Uh, rent to own. Tenant didn't end up buying, turned it into a student rental and then turn it into a legal duplex, and now I'm gonna add a garden suite. 
Yeah. So it's just, yeah. it's the wild. garden sweet stuff's wild in Kitchener. There's a, a rock star member that's just helping people drop garden sweets in their backyards. If their lots are kind of wide enough, that changes the whole game again. Yeah. So there's always an evolution. And then Craig race was in here doing a podcast talking about in Toronto, how laneway housing is just like exploding some opportunities in Toronto where they're buying a single lot that dividing into two, making two triplexes and putting a fourth unit in the back. Mm-hmm. So I think one of them, they turned into a 10 unit. They did four and four in a unit. I saw that project. It was crazy. It's crazy. And they're beautiful products, yeah. beautiful living Super spaces. Nice. I mean, look, if, if culturally people still want to come to Ontario and to live, I think we're get, you know, there, there is a viable strategy for investing. I'm not saying that that's a guarantee. I think people will still look as much it, as, it we, as much as I'm saying, there's all these problems. There yeah. are relative to other parts of the world. It's yeah. still a pretty cool place to come. I agree. Yeah. It's and just, I, I, I get think, disappointed when I'm with some easy changes. I feel like this place could be great. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's, and that's where the frustration for me comes in. Yeah, I think it's also our perspective where we've, we've been all grown up in, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. without going to see the, what the other side of the coin looks like, that's why the demand is still here. That's why immigration is still so high, right? Mm-hmm. Thanks, man. Cam, Thanks appreciate- for letting me have the extra question in. No, hey, listen, I you know I got to have you back because we need to spend like a full ninety minutes talking about Bitcoin at some point. Absolutely. We just taught, we touched on it a little bit. Yeah, we yeah. got to get really in there. Got to go down there, <laughs> down the rabbit hole together. It sounds like anyone who does business with you also gets a, a some kind of ticket to surfing lessons and exploring <laughs> Costa Rica with Jay. So real estate tours, open and surfing yes. lesson combination, Costa Rica. I, I'm actually open invitation to you, Tom. Selfishly, I'm excited for his Costa Rica project because I want to see how that development works, and then I'm going to take all the mistakes he made. Learn totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so I can repeat yeah. it. Repeat Cam, I'm it not going to, I can't believe you did that. It's so <laughs> obvious that you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks guys. Really appreciate this. Man. Appreciate Thank you. you man. Thank thanks, you. Tom. Okay. Thanks all. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. Your life, your terms.